Good morning, Grace Fellowship. Welcome here. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Mark. I am one of the pastors here, if you don't know who I am, along with Clay. We pastor this church together. And today, again, we're continuing on in our uh, series in the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, this was actually a letter that the Apostle Paul had written to the Corinthian church. And we are going to take a very large chunk of text this morning. So we're going to get into it right away. Clay did a great job last week of finishing off chapter 13. And so this week we are going to take uh, the majority of chapter 14. So if you could turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, whether uh, you have the Bible in book or app form, either is fine with me. We're going to be going through verses 1 through 25. So that's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 to 25. So we're going to play this passage out on the screen behind me, and then we're going to pray that God would maybe just reveal a little bit more of himself to us this morning through this text. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 25. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. In the law it is written, By people of strange tongues, and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to count by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. All right, before we 
get into this long piece of text. Let's just pray for wisdom this morning. Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you this morning for all that you have done for us. You are creating for yourself a people, a church, and we get the incredible privilege of being a part of it. And so I want to say thank you for the instructions that you um, have given specifically for your church this morning. I pray that we take it to heart and that we love you by being obedient to your commands and by getting to know you more deeply through your word today. I pray for more revelation of who you are, of what you've done, and how great you are through your word. I pray for Grace Warman specifically this morning. Would you shower your spiritual gifts upon this church, your people, for the expansion of your kingdom and for your glory this morning? I pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so we have a lot of verses to get through this morning, and they're not all very easy ones, so we'll dive right in right away. Verse 1 says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So in chapter 12, going back a while, Paul showed that the church, um, or showed the church, sorry, that the Holy Spirit gives these specific gifts to the church for uh, for a time, some for a short time, some for a long time, some once in a while, and some all of the time. And the Spirit, he gives these gifts to the church for the building up of the church, and he gives these gifts through his people to the church. These gifts, they flow out of Christians to other people so that God's kingdom might grow and thrive, and so that God would be glorified. And then in chapter 13, we saw that the purpose of those gifts was so that love might flow out of us to others. So that specifically, not just not our version of love, but that God's love would flow out of us to others through these gifts. We love one another by allowing the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us to flow out of us to the other people in the church, whether it's gifts of, of teaching or encouragement or administration, whatever it might be, these gifts, they flow out of us to others. So verse 1 of our text today says that we ought to desire these gifts. It is by the gifts of the Spirit that God's love can manifest itself through us towards others. Now, Clay did a great job last week of finishing off chapter 13, showing us that these gifts themselves, they're only here for a time. Um, this new covenant period that we now live in, these gifts are for now, but there is coming a time when these gifts will be unnecessary. But the underlying love that allows these gifts to flow out of us will last forever. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of that love. He will reign forever. This love is now in us as believers through the Holy Spirit. And this love is what gives us the ability to present these gifts of the Spirit to the church. And this love is what will last forever, not the gifts. So when we see Jesus face to face, we will no longer need the gift of prophecy. Well, because we've seen Jesus face to face. We no longer need the gift of encouragement because everything will be perfect. And we will see that we, we will have everything we need in Christ Jesus and the love of Jesus will be our encouragement. We no longer need the gift of administration because out of the abundance of the love of Jesus, he will have everything taken care of for us. He's done it all. And so this is our reward for our faith in Jesus and eternity with him. We will no longer need the gifts of the Spirit to show the love of Jesus to one another and be reminded of who he is because we will be in the presence of Jesus Christ himself. He will remind us of who he is and his love will endure forever because he is love and he has defeated death on the cross. So he will never die. So his love for his people is for eternity. But until that time, while we are here on this earth, before we get to see him face to face, verse 1 tells us to pursue his love, this love that is Jesus. We're to pursue Jesus. We are to desire the gifts that show Jesus that we are filled with his love. These gifts that are given to us during this New Testament or New Covenant period that we now live in. And Paul, he listed a bunch of these gifts in chapter 12 and miracles and healing and administration and, and helping and tongues and wisdom and teaching. And, and there's more there too. And in some of his other letters, he even lists, lists out more gifts. You can look them up in Romans 12 or Ephesians 4. But here in this passage that we're going to be going through today, Paul specifically uh, really drills down on two of 
these gifts that he has mentioned in chapter 12. He's very specific in the text that we go through today. We see in verse 1 that he wants people to earnestly desire that these spiritually gifts, or spiritual gifts sorry, be given to the church, but he wants them to have the wisdom to discern which gifts are more beneficial for the church as a whole. And he wants them to desire the ones that will benefit the church the most. Verse 31 of chapter 12, Paul said this, but earnestly desire the higher or the greater gifts. And then in verse 1 of chapter 14 of our text today, he says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. So Paul especially desires that we as the church have the gift of prophecy. But why? What is the difference between that and the other gifts or the gift of tongues that he mentions in this passage? So let's read verses 2 to 4. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, for no one understands him. But he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up, builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. So, the reason that Paul wants them to desire prophecy over tongues is that one is for the building up of the whole local church, and one is for the building up of one's own faith. So it seems as though this particular church in Corinth was enthralled with the gift of tongues, so they thought it was really cool. They wanted to be like the one who had the gift of tongues. And according to this passage, it looks like they're wanting to show it off in the local church gathering. Tongues was cool, it looked really spiritual, and they wanted to have this gift. Now, it's not that speaking in tongues for uh, building up one's own faith is bad. Paul wants them to have this gift as well, but he wants them to earnestly pursue the greater gifts with a greater desire. Verse 5, now I want you to all speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. He is clear. Both of these gifts, prophecy and tongues, are good gifts, but one is better because of its ability to help the whole church rather than just the individual. He wants them to see that the, the gift of tongues that they so eagerly desire is not as great for the church gathering as the gift of prophecy. And Paul is clarifying that this gift of tongues, as great as it is, it only benefits you during the church gathering. There's generally no benefit for others with this gift. It's like when my wife might choose what to make for supper or for lunch. She could make something that's really good, and she would really enjoy it. But if three of us in the family are allergic to one of the ingredients in it, well, then she would choose to make something else that's really good so the whole family can benefit from it, not just herself. It's not that one meal is better than the other, but one is better for more people. This is the difference between prophecy and tongues. And, and really, this is true for all spiritual gifts, you could say. Paul is just laying out a spiritual principle here that we could apply all the gifts that the, that the Spirit gives the church. There are some that benefit the church more as a whole, and some are more individual. Both are good, but eagerly desire the ones that build up others. This is how we show the love of Jesus to others. And it's likely that this Corinthian church was just getting hung up on the gift of tongues, and they just really thought it was great. And they all wanted to be a part of it. And Paul just reminds them, yes, it's great, but there are better gifts for the church when it gathers. Gifts that benefit not just you. Gifts that build up more than just your own faith, but gifts that build up everyone. And so now we understand what these two gifts are good for and how they're good for different things. One is for the building up of the church, and one was more for the building up of oneself. And it was because of their purpose that one was better than the other. But what are they exactly? It is interesting for sure that in contrasting these two gifts that God has given the church, Paul uses the two gifts that are probably least understood in the church today. There have been many debates over what is really meant by prophecy or what is really meant by tongues. And this morning, I come to you not claiming to know all the answers because some of it is just not super clear. 
But I can tell you what we find in Scripture about these two particular gifts that Paul is talking about in this portion of Scripture. And we're going to start with tongues, and we're going to spend most of our time this morning on this gift, as Paul spends the majority of the text on the gift of tongues, and so naturally I'm going to spend more time on this gift this morning as well. So, this speaking in tongues, it appears to be audible speaking, um, or at least they were doing it out loud during the church gathering in the Corinthian church here, Um, but it was not speaking to men, according to verse 2. So the tongue, or the language that is spoken, seems as though that it's a language that generally humans cannot understand. It's a conversation or speech directed towards God himself. It's a language that the Holy Spirit speaks through us to God that most other people cannot comprehend, even most fellow believers, it would seem. And I, I, don't, I personally don't believe it's a, a human language. Like, say, if Erwin were to start speaking German this morning here during the service and um, then interpret it for us, I mean, it could potentially be a human language, but Paul is pretty specific, as we see in verses 14 and 15, that it's not something that happens with the mind. So it's not a human language you would know, per se. And in Acts 2, it seems as though this, the disciples, they, they speak in tongues, and everyone sort of understands it in their own language. Now, the disciples, they could have just spoken it in their own language that they knew, And God could have interpreted, or the Holy Spirit could have interpreted it for everyone into their own language so people would hear it in their own language. But rather it mentions, it specifically mentions that they spoke in tongues and everyone heard these tongues in their own language. So I don't think that this tongues is a human language. Now some some people would disagree with me and that's perfectly fine. This is not something that's super clear in scripture. So I'm open to someone trying to change my mind on this. However, at this point, to me, it seems as though it is not some human foreign language, but rather it's a spiritual language that the Holy Spirit gives to us. And Paul says this about tongues in verses 7 to 11 of our text. He says, "Even If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives, gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves. If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So basically, if this gift of tongues manifests itself in the church, Paul is clear that others will not be able to understand it. And they will not be able to benefit from it unless you or someone can understand and interpret it for everyone else. Just like if someone, he he uses the the, um, example of instruments and a bugle, like just like if someone plays a song in the guitar and they ask you to sing along, but if you don't know the song, you will not recognize it, you won't understand it, the words won't come to mind, and you won't be able to sing with the instruments. It's foreign to you. You will be like two people who can't communicate with one one another. It leaves... um, Two people who can't want, uh, understand one another. Or if somebody honks the car horn, and if a car horn plays a song instead of a horn blast, the person who heard it wouldn't know to move out of the way. Verse 12, so it is with yourself. So with yourself, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in the building up of the church. So Paul's like, hey, if you're speaking in tongues in the church setting, there needs to be someone who can interpret. If not, then do it alone. He wants them to strive to excel in building up of the church as a whole, not just yourself. So Paul encourages them, hey, strive for the greater gifts, the ones that can benefit everyone during the gathering. Don't get hung up on this gift of tongues. It's great for intimate communion and communication with God, but don't use it to show off to the church how spiritual you are. That's not the best use of spiritual gifts. That can easily become self-promotion. Strive to build up the church as a whole. Stop seeking attention for yourself. When someone speaks in tongues during one of your gatherings, the the people, they will not understand the language of the Spirit and they will be lost. 
They will not be encouraged or built up or taught or warned if you speak in tongues. So what does this language of tongues sound like? Well, we don't necessarily know. Romans 8, verses 26 to 27, it gives us a bit of description of what tongues might look like. Paul says this, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So when we don't know what to pray, when we can't find the words to speak during suffering, or maybe even during worship, like we see in Acts 2 and Acts 10, and when we can't find the right words to describe our gratitude or worship or our suffering or pain, the Holy Spirit then speaks through us on our behalf to God with words or groanings that are too deep for any earthly language. Acts 10 describes the speaking in tongues as extolling God or praising him. And in Acts 2, when the disciples spoke in tongues, many had the privilege of experiencing the gift of interpretation as everyone heard these tongues in their own language. And so the best I can describe this speaking in tongues is that it's something that happens to people by the power of the Holy Spirit to communicate with God, maybe when there are no words to express joy or pain or worship. And in Acts chapter 10, a bunch of people, Gentile people, who had previously been excluded from God's chosen people were now included. This was amazing. This was crazy. They had just been saved. And out of this amazing joy of salvation, they worshiped and spoke in tongues. And in Acts chapter 2, God does this mighty work where a whole bunch of people came together from a bunch of different places, and they're all gathered into a giant multitude, and they all speak different languages. And the disciples, they begin speaking in tongues, and the multitude were given the gift of interpretation by the Spirit, and each person heard these tongues in their own language. And so the disciples, they spoke this spiritual language, extolling God, praising God. And this, as the Spirit gave them utterance, it says, and many unbelievers from all around, they heard this language and they were perplexed. What's going on? And 3,000 people were saved that day. And so we see these examples of speaking in tongues and we see that they're not all exactly the same. Some are private, as Paul describes in Romans 8, during a time of, of weakness and and sometimes it occurs when others are around and it can be interpreted by someone. And so this language is used specifically to speak to God for your building up. It is, and it is given to you by the Spirit. It's not something that's made up by you and it's not something that you muster up. It is something that is done through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul also makes it clear, though, that if there's no one to interpret, then we ought not to speak tongues during the public gathering if it cannot be interpreted. And we ought to remain silent. Verse 6, he says, Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? In other words, if you're speaking in a spiritual tongue when the church is gathered, and it is strictly a conversation between you and God, then it's not going to be helpful to the church. It'll be good for you, and it'll fill you up, but the rest of the church remains unfilled, not encouraged, not taught, not prophesied to, not pointed to Jesus. Unless through your tongue you can deliver some teaching or revelation or knowledge. But in order to do that, you need someone there who God has gifted with interpretation for that time. Verse 13, Therefore one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. So if you speak in a tongue, you should desire that what was spoken of or what was spoken by the power of the Holy Spirit, you could also understand in human language. This would be beneficial for you to teach or encourage or prophesy to the church. If you or someone present knows how to proclaim the words of the Spirit in human language, this would then be beneficial for the church. Verses 14 and 15, For if I pray in a tongue and my spirit prays, but my, but my mind is unfruitful, what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Paul's point is that even though the language of the, the spirit might not seem like any human language, pray that you would know the meaning in your human language so that you might be able to understand with your mind and build up the church with the knowledge 
that has been given to you by the power of the Holy Spirit through this tongue. When you speak in tongues, whether it's through great sorrow or through great joy or even through apathy maybe, and when the Spirit gives you the words to say, pray that you could understand them with your mind. Don't just desire the gift of tongues to show off how spiritual you are in the church. That's not the intention of the gift of tongues, according to Paul. Verses 16 and 17. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. How can anyone say amen to your words or celebrate along with you if they don't even know what you're saying? How can they affirm or agree with you in what you're saying if they cannot understand it? They can't. And so it benefits the next person absolutely nothing. So we see that the tongue, or the spiritual tongues, for believers is for private conversation between the believer and God, unless there are special circumstances where someone might interpret so that the whole church might be built up. We see also in this passage that there is another purpose for spiritual tongues, a purpose that is for unbelievers. And this is another reason why I don't believe it's another human language. Verses 20 to 22. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people And even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. So Paul tells these Corinthians to grow up in their thinking and understand what he's about to say, instead of selfishly and potentially pridefully displaying the gift of tongues to the whole church when they're gathered, um, and just so they can see it when it only benefits you during the church gathering, They should understand that tongues have a purpose for those who do not believe as well. Tongues are a sign to unbelievers. Paul uses the example of judgment from the Old Testament to help us understand. Tongues are not a positive sign to unbelievers, but a sign of judgment. Just as when the Israelites were disobedient in the Old Testament, God would send an army from a foreign nation to punish them. And when this army arrived, they would all be speaking in this foreign language, a language the Israelites could not understand. And this foreign army that was coming against the Israelites in battle would be a sign of judgment that was about to be exercised against the Israelites for their sin and their rebellion against God. And so it is with those who do not believe. Should an unbeliever see or hear a believer speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit in the, in, with the gift of tongues, it is a sign to that unbeliever that God is real, and they are not on team Jesus. God is foreign to them. They're not a part of his kingdom, and judgment is coming. God is still an enemy to those who don't have faith in him. So these tongues, this spiritual language, can remind the unbeliever that they are not on team Jesus, and they are potentially going to experience destruction by a foreign army, God's army, because they won't believe or listen, just like the Old Testament Israelites. And so this gift of tongues is a sign of God's power to those who refuse to believe. Just as the Israelites could not understand the armies that were attacking them in judgment, so too the unbelievers will not understand the language of the Holy Spirit in his people, and it will be a sign of God's power and God's judgment to the unbeliever. Through this gift of tongues, unbelievers will have a glimpse of God's power and his potential wrath to come. And so it is a sign that God is real, he is perfect, and he is so much greater than all that we have on this earth. And humanity is separated from him because we have rebelled against him. So for an unbeliever, this foreign spiritual language is a sign that God is not on their side. Not because God chose to be their enemy, but because they chose to be his. We as humanity have rebelled against Jesus. We have sinned, and we are at odds with him, and we are his enemy unless we by faith believe that Jesus was the Son of God sent to earth to pay for our sin so that we could be made right with him. Only when we have been made right with him will we speak his language by the power of the Holy Spirit that he puts inside of us. And we believe. And so these tongues are a sign for the unbeliever, a sign of wrath and of warning that we need to be made right with God by Jesus' work on the cross. 
That's our only hope. Jesus is the only way. He is everything. So because the gift of tongues is a private language between a person and God the Father, made possible by the Holy Spirit, Paul presents now a better gift to use during the church gathering. Verses 23 to 25, he says, If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by, by all, he is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Paul says, hey, as much as speaking in tongues is a sign to the unbeliever, not a, not a positive sign, but a sign of the fact that they are an enemy of God because of their rebellion to him, if they walked into one of your gatherings and found you all speaking in tongues, you can't understand, wouldn't they just think you're crazy? And they will most certainly know that they do not belong here. But if an unbeliever walks in and they see that all you are prophesying in an orderly manner so that you can understand one another, won't they rather then be convicted of sin, see their need for Jesus, see their sin and their separation, uh, and separation that it has caused from God, and understand their need for Jesus and his work on the cross by your prophecy? Would this not be a better option? Wouldn't it be better to see an unbeliever walk in, hear the prophecy, fall on his face, and worship God because he understood what you said? Sure, with tongues, it's a sign of judgment to the unbeliever, but with prophecy, it's a sign of hope. Jesus has come to make us right with him. And so what is this prophecy that Paul speaks of? We went into what we thought the gift of tongues is, and we spent a lot of time on that, as this passage is mostly about that, but Paul gives us a hint here of what prophecy looks like in the New Testament church as well. Paul says this, If all prophesy, then he would be convicted by all and called to account by all. So we have this hint as to what it could look like in the New Testament church. In the Old Testament Israel, there were specific men who had the Holy Spirit I'm given to them. The Holy Spirit was upon them, so they would prophesy, and God would tell them what to say to the people. And sometimes it was to point out the sin that was going on with Israel and call them to repentance. And sometimes it was to warn them of coming judgment for their rebellion and unrepentant hearts. And sometimes it was to tell the things of the future. Now today, as believers, we all have this same Holy Spirit if we believe by faith that Jesus died for our sin, and rose from the dead. We don't just have certain people that have the Holy Spirit on them as prophets. We all have that same Spirit that can give us, from time to time, the gift of prophecy. Prophecy includes being convicted or being called to account, according to verse 24. Reminding one another of what we find in Scripture, pointing one another to Jesus, calling out sin for what it is, calling one another to account for our actions. These are the things a prophet does, reminding one another of who Jesus is and pointing it out when we are straying, reminding the people of the goodness of Jesus and the badness of our sin. We can all do this as God might give you the gift of prophecy to be able to do these things. And the desired result of this prophecy towards the church or other individuals, according to verse 25, is that the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. The desired end of prophecy in the church, of calling out sin, of reminding one another about Jesus, of keeping one another accountable, is so that humanity falls on her face in repentance and worships Jesus, both believers and not yet believers. This is the purpose of prophecy, that Jesus would be glorified in his church and that more people would come to know him, that more people would be a part of his kingdom. This is for the greater church, not just for the individual. So earnestly desire to show the love of Christ to the church through this gift of prophecy. Now next week, the passage that we are going through is going to take us through a bunch more spiritual gifts. But for today in this passage, Paul wanted to remind this church 
that just because the gift of tongues seems cool and it made you look super spiritual, that was never the point. It was a good gift to be sure. He loves the gift of tongues. And in fact, he says this about it in verse 18 and 19. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So even though he loves the gift of tongues and how the Spirit works through that gift and how uplifting it is for him to experience that gift for himself, during the church gathering, he would rather that the gifts that are for the building up of the whole body be manifested. As much as tongues are awesome and for the building up of the believer, he would rather that everyone experience the gift of the Spirit together or the gifts of the Spirit together. Now, I have never been given the gift of tongues. I have never spoken in tongues. So I don't know what Paul experienced or what some of these Christians might have experienced when they were given that gift. But this much I do know that we as a church, all of us who believe, we have the Holy Spirit and we have actually been given the gifts that the church needs right now as God sees we need them. We do not need to try and muster them up, but we can pray for them and we can desire these gifts to give to the church, that the church might receive them. And when God sees fit, he is going to provide the gifts of prophecy, administration, wisdom, teaching, tongues. He's going to provide all those gifts when we need them. And it's through the Spirit that these gifts are given to us so that Jesus might be glorified through his church, not, us, not ourselves. So let's pray for these gifts right now. Heavenly Father, we pray for the gifts of the Spirit, specifically in this local church, Grace Warman. Not that we might get some emotional high or have some supernatural experience, but rather that sin would be renounced and repented of and that Jesus would be glorified for all that he has done for the human race. I pray that we'd earnestly desire the gifts that you have for us. You, you, you say that's what you want for us. And I pray that we would earnestly desire them so that we would love one another as you have loved us. And that your kingdom would grow and you would get the glory. I pray this in your name. Amen.